Uh, thank you, Bhaskar. Uh, and thank, I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to give this talk. Before we get started, however, I'd like to show of hands of all you folks, uh, the students, not the faculty, the students in the audience, how many are now working on wireless or are contemplating doing so? Okay, good. If I do my job properly, we'll do this at the end and we'll see more hands. <laughs> so there is a very simple reason why you should be working in wireless and why wireless is inherently more important than other areas of communication. And the answer is quite simple. You always can lay down more optical fiber, but you can never lay down more spectrum. So we already saw this uh, this morning, this, uh, uh, sorry, this FCC auction last winter, uh, $41 billion. Uh, Farouk had it 43 or 44, but a considerable amount of money nonetheless. And uh, the, the point being, uh, the entire budget of NSF is on the order of $7 billion a year. And if I had to hazard a guess, I would say that uh, maybe 1% of the NSF budget, $70 million, goes for communications and information theory. So we're talking about big money, and this is important stuff. Uh, at uh, the a big event, Marconi Society, last autumn, where our friend Paul Raj got the top uh, Marconi Society award, one of the five FCC commissioners uh, gave a speech. And I'm going to just pause for about 10 seconds while you read her remark here. Okay, this promise, she, she evidently didn't anticipate that this prize she had in mind, 10 megahertz, would be worth uh, so, but the better part of $7 billion. And so naturally, I paid close attention to her when I heard this. Uh, the other point is that the advocates of massive MIMO believe they have the answer to this challenge. So. Massive MIMO is uh, spatial multiplexing uh, pushed to a very wide and pleasant extreme. Uh, the whole idea is that instead of tiling up the time frequency plane for different users as we do in LTE, every user gets the entire time frequency plane. So massive MIMO is much more than just a large number of antennas. It, it critically depends on how you use the antennas. One of the really important things is using measured channel characteristics to do these, this clever multiplexing, demultiplexing, as opposed to open loop uh, type techniques where you have to use assumed channel characteristics. And you've probably all heard about the benefits. We'll see in subsequent slides how these things come about. So we'll first go through a history of the information theory of massive MIMO. How the, the actual technology didn't necessarily evolve in the same order or was invented in the same order. And then we'll really get into the issue of what is massive MIMO, what is not massive MIMO, uh, an illustrative case study, and then what may be the most interesting part, future directions and beyond. Point-to-point uh, -point MIMO, I was privileged when I joined Bell Labs in 1995. The very first day on the job, Jerry Foschini told me about his work and what we now call point-to-point -point MIMO. Uh, I immediately was persuaded that this was a supremely important invention. And I thought, uh, great, I joined a company that's going to make billions of dollars from this and be the richest telecom company in the world. That did not happen. And uh, it was, uh, I was always told various reasons from people in our wireless business unit as to why this technology wasn't really catching on. Um, 
you've probably all heard about these issues. The point is, it's not really scalable much farther. So here we have an 8x4 link, a fairly low SINR, which is not bad at all if you're near the edge of the cell. Um, and now we're uh, retaining the four antennas at the user end of the link uh, and are going successively from one, two, four, to eight antennas at the base station. And notice that the sum throughput doesn't really increase significantly. You're not really doing multiplexing all of the, with these low SINRs. You just don't get the promised minimum of uh, number of transmit receiver multiplexing gains. Uh, let's go on. So, multi-user MIMO. Um, uh, the theory was absolutely brilliant done by a number of people. Uh, it's easiest if we look at a figure, a cartoon for point-to-point -point MIMO, compare it for a figure with multi-user MIMO. So for starters, we see that in point-to-point -point MIMO, we have channel state information at the receive end. Uh, here we still have it at the receive end, but also at the transmit end. We've split up the uh, one user with multiple antennas into K users, each with a single antenna. And of course, the most remarkable thing about all of this information theory is that the sum throughput is not decreased by this activity of going from the left cartoon to the right cartoon. Okay. Um, the problem with this is, uh, it, well, there are some advantages. Splitting up the users, uh, it doesn't matter if it's clear line of sight propagation, provided the users are far enough apart so that the inherent angular resolution of the transmit array can resolve the different users. So more propagation tolerant. Uh, this was always a perennial reason why uh, massive or why point-to-point -point MIMO wasn't catching on. Here you have only single antenna users. But it's not really scalable, the dirty paper coding, and uh, even more importantly, the requirement of channel state information at both ends of the link. There just is no way in general you can get that economically. Hence, uh, massive MIMO. So here on left we have the uh, Shannon-sanctioned uh, multi-user MIMO. Here we, on the right we have massive MIMO. And what's different? Well, for one thing, we've increased the number of antennas uh, relative to the number of users. Uh, the other thing is these users now don't need channel state information. And in fact, they don't have to do any signal processing at all. There's no dirty paper decoding. Um, and Adding more antennas at the base station, you might have thought, would uh, make a difficult problem even more difficult, but in fact, the opposite happens. And I'll touch on that in the context of signal processing later on in the talk, uh, more general signal processing issues. And you're basically uh, ignoring what Shannon theory is telling you to do to do the absolute optimum. But life gets very easy and pleasant, and as you'll see, the performance is exceedingly good. So here are sort of three pieces of science, if you will, that are the underpinnings of massive MIMO. It's again this fact that if you use measured channel uh, characteristics to do this multiplexing, demultiplexing, your beamforming gain grows linearly with the number of antennas, irrespective of the quality of the channel state information. You might have thought a priori that as you add more and more antennas to continue to get linear increases in beamforming gain, your precision of your CSI would have to get better and better. That is not so. So that was a very important fact. Uh, another is that uh, the channel is, the beamform channel to the users is very flat with respect to frequency. It's very reliable. Its characteristics are described by uh, long-term slow fading coefficients, which there's plenty of time for everybody who needs to know them to estimate them or to find out about them. 
Uh, and a final discovery, pilot contamination. We'll get into all of these things a bit later on. The simplest sort of massive MIMO downlink entails conjugate beam forming, and this uh, works very well. Uh, it has limitations, but uh, here are our antennas, here's our users. We provide each antenna with the QAM symbols intended for each of the users. So consider what happens to Q1, which is intended for U1. Antenna 1 multiplies Q1 by the conjugate of his estimated channel to user one, each of the other antennas does the same thing. So all of these signals entailing Q1 will arrive in phase at user one, hence your amplitude beamforming gain grows with M, the number of antennas. Uh, they tend to arrive out of phase at the other users, hence their amplitude grows as square root of M. Quite simple. And one advantage of this is it lends itself to a decentralized architecture. So you could imagine on downlink something as simple as a binary tree from a central controlling point. You distribute the QAM symbols via this binary tree to all of the antennas. Each antenna has its own ASIC, tiny power amplifier, 10 milliwatts, does all its own processing independent of the other antennas. A lightning bolt hits the thing, knocks out half the antennas, the rest just do what they've done before. Don't even know of the loss of their brothers, okay? Uh, it has limitations. You can sometimes do better with zero forcing, but uh, it can be very effective indeed. Uplink matched filtering is just the opposite, and the same thing holds. So, uh, this issue, why is it so important to do a massive MIMO with measured channel characteristics, directly measured rather than assumed? Well, the, as I said, the gain grows linearly with the number of service antennas, irrespective of the noisiness of these direct measurements. And no tightening of array tolerances. You don't have to know where the antennas are. When I describe massive MIMO for the first time to RF engineers, they often get very nervous because the thought of phasing together precisely hundreds or thousands of antennas really worries them. And then I explain, no, there's, there's no phase coherence required at all. You just have to have good enough frequency coherence over the slot during which you're estimating the channel and using it. Uh, very tolerant. Assume channel characteristics. So uh, one way of trying to avoid direct measurements would be the following. You have, say, a linear array, say 64 antennas. You take a 64-point DFT, transmit 64 orthogonal beams. Each user reports back to you which of the 64 beams is best for him. And then when you transmit data downlink, you transmit through the most favorable beam to each one of these users. What's wrong with that? Well, one thing is, as the array gets bigger and bigger, indeed, the phase tolerances for these open loop beams have to get better and better and tighter and tighter if you're going to get the gains promised. Okay. Another is, if the channel itself starts to depart from line of sight, you're in trouble also. And the limit of 360 degree angle spread, IID Rayleigh fading, you're in a logarithmic region. And what's happening is each user is reporting back the biggest of M of 64 chi-square two degree of freedom random variables. The expected value of the maximum of M chi-square two degree random variables goes as logarithm of M. So it's a terrible thing to get into. Okay. A typical slot, and this is time division duplex, uh, looks like this. The central part is the most important. That's where your users transmit uplink orthogonal pilots. The base station now knows all uplink channels by reciprocity. He also knows the downlink channels. He uses this information to demultiplex the uplink data and to multiplex the downlink data. 
the total training time or burden is proportional only to the number of users independent of the number of antennas. So here uh, on this axis, the number of active users we can train for in service vertically number of service antennas. So we're limited to the right with TDD. It's the mobility of the users that ultimately limits us, but there's no limit vertically. If I do FDD, I have to transmit downlink pilots, uh, send the uplink CSI, which is most uh, efficiently done by raw analog transmission, combined with uplink massive MIMO, analog massive MIMO, uplink pilots, and I'm confined to this small red region here. Okay, so self-evident FDD is a disaster. Uh, this issue of just how much am I giving up by uh, foregoing dirty paper coding and decoding. So here we have a simple example, 16 users, K16, 0 dB SINR, uh, and we're plotting out some throughput, theoretical sum throughput, going from 20 base station antennas up to 100. The blue curve is the optimum Shannon limit, which you can get with dirty paper coding. Red is what you get with massive MIMO. This is actual performance of conjugate beam forming up to this kink in the curve, and then at that point, uh, zero forcing was better, and we got the rest of the curve. And notice, when we're up at 60 antennas for a dirty paper coating, there's only a gap of nine antennas, or it's 56 or seven antennas for dirty paper coating. There's only a gap of nine antennas in the performance. So it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's a little bit suboptimal, but it's awfully good. So pilot contamination. You want to give each of the users uh, its own orthogonal pilot sequence. Uh, you do that within a cell, but in the next cell, what happens if you have to reuse these pilots? There's only so many pilots you can fit into a time interval over which the channel can be trusted not to change. I reuse the pilots in another cell. My home base station correlates the uplink pilot signals with, say, pilot sequence one, and guess what? He gets the linear combination of the channel to the user with pilot one in the home cell, plus the channel to the user in the next cells who are also using pilot one. And then when he does beam forming to this user number one, without even knowing it, he's coherently transmitting power to these poor guys in the other cell. And the effects of that don't go away with the number of antennas because the bad stuff, the coherent intercell interference grows at the same rate as does the good stuff in the home cell. So, sorry, uh, pilot contamination has always existed, but nobody ever pushed things to an extreme like this before, so it was never noticed. So, what can you do about pilot contamination? Some people propose exploiting special properties of the uh, of the uh, propagation to somehow make more time for learning the channel or to exploit sparsities that would make it easier to estimate the channel without pilot contamination. One measure is to make the cells smaller. So under certain conditions, you can show that the total throughput per cell is independent of the size of the cell. So just more cells, smaller. Do massive MIMO in each cell. Another measure which we have frequently looked at in our simulations is a pilot reuse factor greater than one. We'll talk about that next. Uh, also, you can actually try some signal processing based on slow fading coefficients. My colleague Alexei Sheikman originated that. But it seems to be a fundamental problem. I would actually like to see if some Shannon theorists could somehow show that this is indeed fundamental. Uh, the problem is most Shannon theory likes to assume you have perfect CSI, and it's very difficult, or it's always some sort of handy approximation to handle imprecise CSI. So this issue, pilot reuse 3, 4, 7, the idea is if I'm doing pilot reuse 3, I have, say, uh, 20 users to work with, so 20 point 
orthogonal pilot sequences are sufficient for my cell, but what if I make it 60 points? Now there's three times as many as I need, so I can give my own guys and in the neighboring cells pilot sequences which are completely orthogonal among themselves. The overhead is that you're now spending more time on training, less on sending data. So uh, you can variously do three, four, seven, and you three or four, you surround the home cell with one ring of non-contaminating cells, seven, it's two rings of non-contaminating cells. So let's see what happens. Uh, just to indicate how we do <coughs> our simulations, uh, we model, in the case of a single cell, we have a uh, frequency dependent uh, propagation between the mth antenna and the kth user, which is a slow fading uh, coefficient that captures geometric attenuation and log normal shadow fading. Fast fading, which we conveniently assume is IID uh, Rayleigh fading, uh, known to nobody. Betas are known to anybody who legitimately needs to know them. And we use Bayesian methods to estimate the channel based on training. And we take this channel estimation into error, in a, uh, error into account when we figure out how well does, say, conjugate beam forming or zero forcing work. So downlink data, this is again single cell. Uh, two types of linear precoding, conjugate beam forming. So here, uh, this is the matrix that we multiply the vector of QAM symbols by to map into the vector of signals that get transmitted over the antenna array. And that's just the conjugate of the channel estimate, zero forcing, it's a um, pseudo inverse. And these can be uh, analyzed very tractably. To give you a flavor as to how this is done, uh, for conjugate beam forming. Uh, this is the vector signal that my users collectively receive. It's the true channel times the uh, signal, conjugate beam form signal transmitted by my array plus noise. We replace the true matrix by the estimated matrix and then we of course have to subtract off the estimation error. If this is uh, Bayesian then this junk over here can constitute effective noise because it's uncorrelated with the channel estimate. Estimation error is always uncorrelated with the estimate itself. Well, uh, looking at what the kth user receives, it's the same sort of thing, but the user is a Bayesian. Uh, he doesn't know what the channel estimate is. He only knows the mean of the channel estimate. So this is the effective gain that the kth user gets. We again have to subtract off our lack of knowledge. So now we have good stuff, which is a deterministic gain. Notice it's growing with the, directly with the number of antennas and its power is dependent on the, the mean square value of the Bayes channel estimate. Doesn't matter how bad it is, it'll still grow as M. And then we have four sources of uncorrelated effective noise. We evaluate the variance of each of the four, take an SINR, and it gets very simple. These eta's, by the way, and what happens, look at this. The, notice the instantiation of the channel, which uh, is G, has disappeared. We have a stable, predictable, effective gain that doesn't depend on frequency. These eta's are a power control coefficients uh, to handle near-far effects. Again, remember I said it's important to provide everyone in the cell with equally good service. Well, it really works and is really easy for massive MIMO because these power control coefficients are frequency independent and they can be uh, derived according to only slow fading coefficients. And notice the numerator and denominator are only linearly dependent on power control coefficients. So inequality constraints on SINR are equivalent to linear inequality constraints on power control coefficients. So any sort of optimal max min or wh whatever you have uh, type of power control is equivalent to some type of linear programming problem. Very easy and nice. We can do this analysis for complete multicellular systems, and so we have a complete two-by-two two matrix, downlink, uplink, 
conjugate beam forming matched filtering zero forcing that takes everything into account, channel estimation, error. Uh, here is pilot contamination. Notice this term in the denominator grows just like the numerator does, and it's due to pilot contamination from the cells that reuse the same pilots that the home cell used. Uh, it just doesn't go away with M. As you can see, it's the only thing left when M goes to infinity. So we use these for, uh, for many simulations. Here it's a case study of uh, uh, what's the optimum pilot reuse factor to use, three, four, or seven. And that's scenario dependent. Dense urban, you have uh, low mobility. This is still fairly high mobility. We're working in a uh, two millisecond slot. This is 1.9 gigahertz, so we actually can handle uh, high mobility, 70 kilometers an hour in dense urban, 140 in suburban with uh, the uh, sh shorter pilot uh, uh, sequence or, or slot. Uh, these are modest size systems, 64 antennas for dense urban, 256 for suburban. We use max min power control, which gives all 18 users uh, equal service. So you're really evening out the service. Uh, th this uh, notion that some throughput is important or peak throughput for somebody that you place right next to the base station, these are really irrelevant criterion and they're more PR than sound business. So what we have here are, uh, I'll go through these quickly, but look at dense urban for example. This is downlink and we have uh, cumulative distributions of the pair user throughput, net throughput where you've accounted for the fact that you're also receiving uplink data, you're receiving uplink pilots and so on. And we do this, uh, basically this purple curve is pilot reuse seven and uh, black and red are pilot reuse three and four, somewhat worse. Uh, pilot reuse one, which means that you're surrounded by seven pilot contaminating cells is quite a lot worse. But uh, so reuse seven is the best overall. Notice this is giving a median throughput per user of better than five megabits per second, a 95% likely throughput per user of four megabits per second. This is quite, quite good and can be scaled up with simply more antennas or sizing the cell smaller or something else. Uh, let's just move on now to perhaps the uh, most interesting part of the talk. So, uh, in terms of research that one can do in massive MIMO, there's of course huge amounts of pieces needing to be done to reduce it to practice. I mean, how many tens of thousands of engineering person years went into developing LTE? I've never seen an estimate, but it must be 20 to 50,000, I would assume. So similarly for Massive MIMO. But there are lots of things you can do that are more visionary. So one thing that we're looking at uh, is cell-free Massive MIMO. The idea is a college campus or an entire city has millions of randomly distributed access points, single antenna access points, that act collectively as a giant distributed Massive MIMO array and serving, you know, 50, 100,000 mobile users at once via the principles of Massive MIMO. Um, another possibility is fixed wireless access to home. So uh, one of the speakers this morning pointed out that optical fiber to home, Fios, is proving to be tremendously expensive and Verizon is shying away from it. Well, you have these gravity water towers, you could put a huge conformal array on top and serve a thousand homes with sustained throughput per home of 20 megabits per second. Here's a much more modest example, 250 antennas serving 100 homes in a 250 meter radius and giving each home highly reliable 20 megabits down, 10 megabits up and total system throughput uh, equivalent to a spectral efficiency of 150 bits per second per hertz. Uh, 
Multicasting is an interesting thing. So uh, suppose I have a list of movies for people to watch, HD movies, and anybody can dial up their own movie. So we want to do this with massive MIMO. Uh, the simplest way uh, would be to give each one in the audience an orthogonal pilot sequence, and you simply transmit your uplink orthogonal pilot sequence and signal which of the movies you want to watch. But you can actually do things much more efficiently by deliberately taking advantage of pilot contamination. And how do we do this? Let's suppose there were two, movie or two TV programs to watch. So there's The Rifleman and The Muppets. So let's assume the women in the audience want to watch The Rifleman and the men want to watch The Muppets. So what we do is we have only two pilot sequences, one for The Rifleman and one for The Muppets. The women are going to transmit the Rifleman pilot sequence, the men the Muppets pilot sequence. And the stupid array, without even knowing what it's doing, is going to send the Rifleman to the women and the Muppets to the men. So you're taking advantage of a nasty effect to your... Uh... All right, what else? <coughs> uh, yes. What else? I mean, you can do MIMO and massive MIMO in non-electromagnetic media. And the nice thing about these non-electromagnetic media is experiments are an awful lot easier than doing them with RF. So if, if one were interested, you could actually do these in a lab uh, under controlled conditions with uh, very relatively simple equipment. So acoustic massive MIMO, elastic waves in solids, uh, what about heat diffusion? Uh, electric current, that's, a dif that's just diffuses like heat. There's precedent for electric current. During the First World War, uh, these horrendous battles, the Somme, Verdun, and so on that you read about, what always happened was the advancing line would lose contact, communications contact, with the artillery because of the heavy shellings. I mean, before the Somme, there were five days of shelling, three million shells or something. They would just dig up the ground to a depth of a couple of meters or more, and any telegraph telephone wires would be cut. But it was found that if, and everybody's heard of these people, Richard Courant, uh, Courant and Hilbert book, the Courant Institute of Mathematics at New York, Sommerfeld, of course, the physicist, Lee DeForest, the inventor of the three-element vacuum tube, they contributed to this. But the idea was you put a couple of stakes in the ground, run a current through them, and it moves out laterally for quite a distance. So with another pair of column antennas in the ground, and sensitive equipment, you can detect this. So you could, in principle, use MIMO to actually do multiplexing with this. And think of some applications. You know, people talk about eventually uh, embedding millions of electrodes in the cortex of the brain for something, artificial retinas and so on. How do you get these signals out? So uh, who knows, maybe one of these alternative types of MIMO might do the trick. That could be great fun to work with the biomedical people on. Uh, sensor telemetry. So. A little bit of philosophizing here. Uh, if a lot of us have different opinions about what's the most important signal processing, in my book, the three outstanding examples are reflection seismology. Uh, my first job was in the petroleum industry with Schlumberger, and that at, at, when I started, I think when you drilled, you had about a 10% chance of hitting a hydrocarbon. Today it's 30 or 40%. It's not that the mathematicians have gotten smarter. They're finally taking the data properly. 3D seismics. Okay. Uh, computer tomography. The whole idea was to take the X-ray slices essentially over a continuum of angles and then the inverse radon transform, which is an integral operation, uh, suggests exactly what to do. Uh, Synthetic aperture radar, all of these three things create huge data sets, but they're based on Nyquist sampling in space and time. You remove that, you have sparser data sets, but the signal processing will be infinitely more difficult and the quality infinitely worse. So 
uh, pruning, data pruning, and all of that just doesn't work, it seems, when you're dealing with physics-based data. So, again, why not deploy millions of sensors and use massive MIMO? The state of California, to my mind, should have a billion seismometers distributed over the state, constantly sending their signals back to a central, intact, no pruning, no pre-processing, back to a central point. If you monitor this continuously, you probably, who knows what you would see, but I bet you, you can actually image what's going on and get advance warning of earthquakes. Uh, this final comment, all of the, uh, I think in the next five years or more, uh, the impetus for massive MIMO is going to be entertainment. Nobody anticipated that uh, people five, ten, ten years ago, no one anticipated that people would want to send snapshots back and forth, videos, that sort of thing. Five or ten years from now, people will want holographic video constantly, and they'll have some type of unobtrusive augmented reality display device. So how are you going to get that sort of data, 100 megabits per second, a gigabit per second, for 200,000 people around Times Square on a sunny day? Okay. The final question. I'm not going to try to answer here because it's a very difficult one, very pertinent. Uh, I have some ideas, but obviously I want to keep those to myself for now. And I hope that somebody in this audience will be working on this and making headway. So final show of hands, who wants to work in wireless now? Is it any more than before? <laughs> well, in any case, I'll stop here. Thank you.